macam kan je. Yo, greetings everyone and welcome again to the PSCM or Mojo session. Uh, today is Sunday the 23rd of August 2020. Today we'll be having our brother Mandingo on today and he'll be looking at the topic of reparation or repatriation. And remember we're still in Garvey's month so it's, a, so it's done in the context that we're still looking at the lives and time of uh, Marcus Garvey. So what I'd like to do now, I'd just like to hand you over to uh, Brother Mandingo. So Brother Mandingo, are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay, yeah. So I'll just pass you over to you now so you can start your presentation. Okay. Ujambo, which is Kiswahili for greetings. And I give thanks and praises to the almighty creator, Onyame Olodomare Chuku Mawulisa, this Sunday, the 23rd of August. 2020. Yes, my topic today dealing with reparations and repatriation. And as a Pan Africanist in the school of the greatest Pan Africanist leader ever, Marcus Messiah Gavi, I must say to one and all that we must remember to always study and practice the implementation of Marcus Garvey's black print solution that he gave to the African race. It was on Monday the 17th of August that we, 2020, that we celebrated, commemorated the 133rd anniversary of the passing of Marcus Messiah Gavi from this physical, I mean, his, 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 his birth. The birth of, let me rephrase, it was on Monday the 17th of August that we celebrated the 133rd birth anniversary of Marcus Messiah Gavi, the greatest Pan-Africanist leader the world has ever known. And Marcus Gavi, who founded the UNIA and ACL on the 20th of July, 1914 at 32 Charles Street, Kingston, Jamaica, was indeed the greatest of all our Pan-Africanist visionaries and leaders. You know, there's a saying that a people without vision perish. But Marcus Garvey gave us the perfect vision. With respect to reparations and repatriation i have to call the name of his son marcus gavi jr who was his who was the seventh president general of his father's organization marcus gavi jr was my physics teacher at Kinson Technical High School in Jamaica in the 1960s. And he was also the political leader of a political party, the African Nationalist Union, that he and I and others, Brother Elder Cyril Stewart, Brother Thomas, Brother Newman, and others formed in 1968 in Jamaica. And we had a paper known as The Black Man. In 1992, in 1992, on the 500th observation, commemoration of what Marcus Garvey Jr. designated 
as the 500 Holocaust observance of what happened to us as the African race. And he said, as the president general of the organization, the seventh president general, that every October 12th, every October 12th of every year must be commemorated. Not celebrated, but must be commemorated as African Holocaust Day. Why the 12th of October? Because it was on the 12th of October that Christopher Columbus, Cristobal Colon, from Genoa, Italy, in the service of Isabella and Ferdinand of Spain, invaded the region and landed at an island known as Guanayani, Guanayani that he renamed San Salvador. And that date ushered in the theft of the land of the native people of the world, that side of the world, and also their virtual extermination, and also brought into play the capturing and transport of our African ancestors as prisoners of war to the Caribbean and beyond. And in terms of the commemoration Marcus Garvey Jr. as the seventh president general, and it was in August of 1992 at the monthly convention of the UNIA and ACL, which was held in the USA, that we also seek reparations, not just from the European Christian who enslave and murder our people but also the arab muslims who had been murdering and enslaving our people so we demand reparations not just from european christians but also from the arab muslims and their descendants who were involved in the biggest Holocaust in history. In terms of this, the interest that we seek is not just in the monetary interest, must be at compound interest, not at simple interest. But there's also involved in our reparations that African people have to repair their minds because the minds of African people have been damaged by this biggest genocide in history because mental enslavement was part of the process of the destruction of the African race. Because as Marcus Garvey Jr. said, no one willingly volunteers to be enslaved. It is a process of vicious so-called seasoning as the Europeans called it. Yes, the methods that they employed as you know, terroristic methods of torture you know, murdering and whipping and all manners of torture that they carried out so that other Africans who were witness to these tortures and these murders would be afraid to rise up against them. And 
as part of the process of reparations and repatriation, we have to emancipate ourselves from mental slavery, as his father said, because none but ourselves can free our minds. Because an enslaved mind will always be captive. You don't need shackles around your, on your feet or on your hands if you are mentally enslaved. And this is the situation today still with a lot of our people. So the question first of identity is absolutely important. That month in 1992, there were 20 policy positions. I won't state all 20 policy positions, but I'll state the ones with respect to reparations and repatriation. One of them, and I've said before, is that we demand, we demand reparations from the European Christians and the Arab Muslims and all those other non-Africans who were involved in the enslavement of African people. And let me just say that some of the non-Africans who were involved with the enslavement of African people along with the European Christians and the Arab Muslims were some European Jews. That's a fact. Some European Jews. And we must not be afraid to call the names of those who were involved in our enslavement. We must not be put off by lies about we are being anti this and anti that. We are stating the facts of the matter. The historical record showed the roles played by Europeans, European Christians, Arab Muslims, and also by some European Jews also. Okay? That, that's, that's a fact. There are books with those historical records. So when we speak, we speak factually with truth, and also go on YouTube and watch Dr. Marcus Garvey Jr., same Dr. Marcus Garvey Jr., in a video called Dr. Marcus Garvey Jr. and the Arab Slave Trade, where he also deals with this, the issues of reparations and repatriation. And the countries that must receive the countries that must receive and the peoples who must receive reparations are our people who are in mother africa from the countries from which our people were taken by force our african countries in the caribbean jamaica trinidad barbados the other islands the Africans in the USA, Africans in Brazil, and elsewhere. We demand this. And I remember in 1992, when Marcus Garvey Jr. sent me the 20 policy positions, we had that 500 commemoration in Jamaica. And I represented the UNIA and the ACL at a meeting at the park in half a tree, St. Andrew, Jamaica. And I also remember the late Del Jones, the war correspondent, who Oh, that man then goes dropped out. Um... Yeah, so see, like uh, Mandinka has just dropped out for a while. 
So um, while we try and get him back, what I will do, because I know he has a very, very interesting um, presentation. He's, he's back in. It's okay, he's back in. Yes. Put yes. him back on the screen. Yes. 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 Drop out a bit. All yes. right. Yes. Put you back in. I came back. Yeah. I, I, yes, I have re-entered some technical gremlin. And, you know, as a member of the PACM, around thereabouts 1980, with Brother Pepper Kai and others, you know, I, I remember that Brother Del Jones, the war correspondent, or African brother from the States, who is now an ancestor, he was a regular um, and welcome visitor to PACM meetings where he spoke a lot. Just as I used to lecture at PACM meetings upstairs at 25 West Green Road in Tottenham, near to Seven Sisters Tube Station on Sunday afternoons, along with other Africans like Brother Gobin and, 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 and others. Yes, indeed. So. Brother Dale Jones in 1992 was at the park in Half a Tree as part of the commemoration of the 500 commemoration of, um, of when our people, the African Holocaust Day, that Marcus Garvey Jr. said that we should always commemorate, you know, and Brother Dale Jones was one of the speakers along with myself. And this meeting in Half a Tree Park was well attended. Now, let me say this. The fact of the matter is that we are not naive. European Jews have gotten reparations. Japanese in the USA have gotten reparations. Everybody else has gotten reparations except our African race. And this is deliberate. Now let me also remind one and all right now that marcus garvey said power is the only argument that satisfies man because man woman is not moved by prayers or petitions but man or woman is only moved by the power that forces them to move whether they want to move or not read the philosophy and opinions of marcus garvey the black print for this what i'm saying is we as africans will only get reparations will only get reparations when we acquire the economic and military power to force our enemies to pay reparations they will not pay reparations willingly. It is only when we as Africans organize ourselves, as Marcus Garvey said, with the necessary economic and military power to force European Christians and Arab Muslims and others to pay reparations to us. You know, it was today I was looking at a program and it was showing the plight, the injustice meted out in 1952 to the Africans in Kenya whose lands were taken by force. Our people were driven off their lands. Some of them were murdered and some of our women, girls were raped by the British. 1952, and our people driven off their land. And yet, and yet, 
being driven off their land. No compensation. No compensation at all. And those lands, many, many acres, thousands of acres of fertile land owned by five European companies. The largest of them, Unilever. And you know what they do? They cultivate tea and export to Europe and elsewhere, making billions, billions. They seized our land in Kenya in 1952, making billions whilst our people who were driven off their land in Kenya are impoverished. And when demands were made, and there was a brother, he was a teenager at the time, and he was speaking about how his family, family was driven off the, their land. And when they asked for the return of their land and compensation, you know what this current British regime government said? That it happened so long ago that there's nothing to be done about it because it happened so long ago. This is just 1952. So you see, they laugh at us because we do not have the necessary economic and military power. And let's face it, the Organization of African Unity, now called the African Union, have not provided the protection that Africans need at home and abroad. As a matter of fact, one finds that Africans, the, the, the so-called OAU, now called the AU, a lot of the budget comes from the very Euro European countries to finance the budget of the AU. How ridiculous. How can you be having an organization that is supposed to deal with African interests and your enemies are the ones who you depend on to finance your budget? Even the new building in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia was built not by African countries, but was built by China. Was built by China. Gaddafi the Arab Muslim from Libya actually wanted the new African Union building to be moved, the AU to be established. Insert the place where he was born in Libya. And a lot of African countries said no, quite rightly so. But the thing is, and Gaddafi did build a building, but he was denied what he wanted. Can you imagine that? The, 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 the African Union building would have been in a Arab Muslim controlled African country. Because remember, the Arab Muslims are in Africa as invaders, and they are still in Africa as invaders. We don't care how long they have been there. All non-Africans in Africa, in positions of power, are there because their ancestors came in and conquered. Whether it was in South Africa, West Africa, North Africa, etc. We do not care. And as Marcus Gavi said, Africa, belongs to the Africans, those at home and those abroad. And in terms of mastering science and technology, which Marcus Garvey Jr. said that we must, which Marcus Garvey himself said that we must in the philosophy and opinions, with the Chinese building the African Union building in Addis Ababa, meaning the new flower, Amarik, in Ethiopia. You know what that means? 
none of our deliberations, none of our meetings in the AU are secure. Because in building it, they have built it with eavesdropping equipment that they are monitoring visually and audio wise our meetings in the AU, public and otherwise. And let me say that part of the process in terms of reparations and repatriation is that all the countries in the Caribbean, like Jamaica and Haiti, as Marcus Garvey Jr. said, should be members of the African Union. Not just as observers, but Haiti, Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and other countries in the Caribbean, where the vast majority of the population is African, must be member countries of the African Union. And the African New Union needs to be an African Union because it is still not an African Union because one of the major mistakes that was made by the two most important founders of the Organization of African Unity, President Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana and Emperor Haile Selassie I of Ethiopia, was that they included Arab Muslim countries in what was supposed to be the Organization of African Unity. You cannot have an Organization of African Unity and you have Arab Muslim countries in the organization. Because what those Arab Muslim countries did, people like Nasser in Kemet, misnamed Egypt, those in Algeria and elsewhere, is that they use the organization of African unity to push their own Arab League interests. That was what happened. The Organization of African Unity, the AU, must be like Marcus Garvey's organization, the UNIA and ACL, an exclusively African organization, whereby we will deal with non-African countries because that's the reality of world politics, geopolitically. But we will deal with them and the standpoint as they are foreign to us and they have their own foreign interests. We as Africans have our own specific interests. And we know that in terms of allies, that there are no permanent allies, but we have permanent interests as Africans. Because the ally of today is the enemy of tomorrow. And we do not want a situation like what has happened in the past where there has been collusion between Arab Muslims and European Christians in terms of the capture, invasion, and division of Africa. In some cases, what we are having is that there's a sharing of the spoils of Africa by the Chinese and the Europeans, even though they are fighting each other to recolonize Africa. It's a very, very serious situation. One of the things that we have to deal with in terms of reparations is that we must get rid of this regime in Zimbabwe, Mangwagwa's regime, who have agreed to pay 2.6 billion pounds to the British as so-called compensation when they should be paying our people in Zimbabwe reparations, not the other way around. And for those of you who don't know, another thing that the Managua regime, Mangagua regime in Zimbabwe have done 
for example, is that they have appointed an Israeli to be the honorary consul for Zimbabwe in the Zionist state of Israel. First of all, with President Mugabe leading the ZANU PF government, there were no diplomatic relationships with the state of Israel because the government of President Mugabe supported the right of the Arabs in Palestine not to be driven off the lands that they were living on. But this regime has had relationships with them and Sudan, Sudan, which is controlled by an Arab Muslim mentality dictatorship really i've been having secret talks with the state of israel this is what is this is what is happening as as we as we speak and what is going on is that none of the countries in the caribbean like jamaica Barbados, etc. The political regimes in those countries, Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, Jamaica, St. Vincent, Grenada, they have not sought to become members of the African Union and work in unity in tandem with our African countries in Mother Africa to present a united front on the international stage. And this is absolutely a must if we are to achieve anything as African people. And what this means is that at the grassroots level in all the countries in Africa and in the Caribbean is that African people at the grassroots level have to rise to the occasion to put pressure and to remove the misleaders in the Caribbean and Africa who are betraying the interests of people. Almost all the political so-called heads of government in Africa and in the Caribbean are not operating in the interests of the African majorities, the African people in their respective countries. What they do is that they act as neo-colonial agents and they send money that they have stolen from our countries and bank in either the USA, Switzerland, Britain, France, etc. Their loyalty is not to their African race. They serve the interests of our foreign racist imperialist enemies. And this is why I always have to remind people that they must stop referring to these individuals as African leaders. A leader is someone who operates in the interests of their people. So you cannot call people who are in Kenya, in Zimbabwe, in Jamaica, wherever, in any countries where the populations are overwhelmingly African, you cannot call people at the political helm leaders if they are not acting in the economic and political interests of the African peoples in the countries where we are. They must be seen and called what they are, traitors and misleaders, enemy agents. And if you need to have a full understanding of what I mean, read President Kwame Nkrumah's classic book, Neocolonialism, that shows the roles of these agents.
Anytime you have African leaders, you always know because the racist media always attacks them and calls them dictators and that they are no good. So they attack President Kwame Nkrumah. They attack President Secretary of Guinea. They attack Patrice Lumumba in the Congo. They attack President Mugabe. Malema in South Africa is attacked. Anytime you see any African leader being attacked by the European imperialists, you know that those people are acting in the interests of the African race. And any individual or individuals who you see they praise, like how they praise Nelson Mandela, are people who are acting in their interests and not in the interests of their African people. This is absolutely a point that must be understood. There are many organizations worldwide and there will continue to be Pan-African organizations worldwide. But what is necessary is for the different Pan-African organizations in different countries is that they should work together because we have one common interest. So Pan-African individuals and Pan-African organizations in Britain must work with like ones in the USA, like ones in France, like ones in Jamaica, like ones in Canada, Nigeria, Senegal. The organizations and the individuals exist. And we must always judge individuals and organizations. And remember that before you can have an organization, you have to have individuals because it is individuals who make up organizations. We have to work to increase the number of Pan-Africanist individuals. The more Pan-Africanist individuals that we have will be the more successful our work in implementing the black print solution of Marcus Mosiah Gavi. And as I said, in terms of reparations, as I said, in terms of repatriation, Africans in the diaspora must be free must be allowed to repatriate to any country in Africa that they so desire. I repeat, Africans in the diaspora must be free to repatriate to any country in Africa that they seek to go to live. Definitely. But before going, one should make adequate preparations. One should not go to Africa just like that. Establish links before going to settle. And Marcus Gavi, and Marcus Gavi Jr. himself, and I myself, another Pan Africanist, say that it is not all Africans in the diaspora who want to go to Africa, that should be allowed to go to Africa. Because some of them have been so mentally enslaved that they will carry their mentally enslaved ways to Mother Africa to create and add to the confusion and chaos there rather than bettering things. As Marcus Gavi said, some would be best left where they are.
because they are of no good use in the diaspora and likewise they would be of no good use in the motherland of Africa. This is very, very important. You know, we want people who are mentally emancipated. We don't want people to go to Mother Africa to add to the chaos and confusion. We want people to go to help to make things better for our people. And at all times, what we must do is that we must use science and technology and keep in constant touch with each other because communication is very, very important. Most of the media systems that we use to communicate are not made and controlled by us as African people. We need to have our own scientific and technological media systems owned and controlled by us as African people. And as part of the process of enhancing um, things for the benefit of, of African people, we need to harness the skills of our African doctors, scientists, and engineers in the diaspora in service of building the necessary infrastructure in Mother Africa, in our African countries, because our countries in Africa are in need of scientific and technological you know, uh, highways and that type of thing. We are in need of um, that type of de development. Another thing to aid us in terms of reparations and repatriation is that we must reestablish the Black Star Line that Marcus Garvey started. And the purpose of the Black Star Line was not to take Africans in the diaspora and carry them to Mother Africa. The purpose of the Black Star Line was to foster trade between Africans on a global scale so that we would empower ourselves. That is, was the purpose of the, the Black Star Line. And in tandem in this time with the Black Star Line, as I said, we must have a Black Star Line fleet of ships, container ships and so on, trading, between Africans worldwide, we should have the equivalent plane service whereby we have flights, planes owned and controlled by us, flying from the Caribbean to countries in Africa and vice versa and elsewhere, to Brazil, Brazil, which has the second largest population of Africans in the world as a country after Nigeria. So we need to not secure our own modes of transport and trade by having our own shipping lines, Black Star shipping lines, and also our airlines, civilian and military. Remember, as I said, we would only get reparations when we, and repatriation, when we acquire, I mean, in a full sense, I mean, we will do things in the meantime, but to come fully on stream, we will only get our full demands met in terms of reparations and repatriation when we have, as Marcus Garvey said, a continental African-based government with one president, one army, one navy, and one air force. Such a continental African superpower would force the non Africans who owe us to pay our just demands for reparations and also for repatriation. But in the meantime, we continue to do what we can do with the tools that we have fashioned for our own interests and as usual i want to commend the pacm organization for the mighty pan-africanist works that they have been doing over the years 
I am remembering my brother in Birmingham, brother Binny Brown, a staunch and strong Pan-Africanist. Stay strong, my brother. And all the other Pan-African brothers and sisters worldwide, let us rededicate ourselves and continue to work constantly, constantly, day and night, for the implementation of Pan-Africanism to realize our feasible dreams in terms of reparations and repatriation. Remember, Africa for the Africans, for those at home and those abroad. I remain your Pan-Africanist soldier in service forever, day and night. I, Mandingo, a proud Pan-Africanist from Jamaica, who from my school days at Kinson Technical High School, I have never wavered in my fight and in my service for the best for my African race. One creator, one aim, and one destiny. A race without authority and power is a race without respect. And Brother Tahaka, keep on doing the good, good work. Because the PACM TV Live is another important and indispensable medium that we as Africans have to have and continue to have. Because no one can speak for us except us. And the PACM TV Live is such an organ of Pan African liberation. Up ye mighty race. We shall accomplish what we will. Asante Sana. Okay, so um, this is the time for all those who are watching to send in their questions or their comments so we can uh, also discuss them. While we are waiting for that to happen, I'd just like to touch on a few points that you brought up. Just, um, now, one of the things you said during your uh, presentation is that Africans, anywhere in the diaspora, should be free to return to any part of Africa they like. Now, um, one, I think you said that was in lines in line with garbage thinking. Yes, I, yes, 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 yeah. yes, yes. I okay, so, so that was in line with garbage thinking. And two, how practical do you think that would be? Let Let me say this is why I later said that to go to Mother Africa, one should prepare first. Mm -hmm. That one should establish links say one is going to go to ghana or to nigeria or to kenya get in touch with brothers and sisters from those respective countries establish links go to the for example the embassies to get information about those countries in terms of laws and procedures and that type of thing. Also get in touch with people from, if you're going to Kenya or if you're going to Ghana, get in touch and establish friendly relationships with people who are already citizens of those countries. This will get one acclimatized and you know to become aware of the situation in the country that one chooses to go to and in going one would need to make more than one trip one should make a trip certainly at first to go and see for oneself because with all the advice and so on that one will get and friendship and so on Nothing beats going for yourself and examining and seeing things on the ground and seeing what will suit you 
and what might not suit you. Because it might be a case that a person goes to Nigeria and things they do not find to their suit to where they want to go in Nigeria. So they might switch to say they want to go to Ethiopia or Ghana, etc. But it is absolutely essential to do that necessary homework of establishing links with our brothers and sisters. And there are our brothers and sisters from the motherland who are in the diaspora. So it is not a problem to make these links. Another thing which will help is that say one is going to Nigeria or Ghana, learn to speak some of the languages and don't say that it is hard because where there's a will, there's a way. Whenever you learn to speak a language of a place that you intend to settle or you even to go as a tourist, things will be easier for you because by speaking the language, you're at an advantage as compared to if you do not speak the language. I, for example, I am, um, I always, I've always loved languages, you know, and as much as possible, I practice um, Yoruba, I practice Kiswahili, I practice Tree, which is a language of the Akan. So learn. And in terms of languages, the best way to learn any language is not just with textbooks. Textbooks are good but by actually speaking the languages. Do you know that even the language that you were born and grew up hearing, if you do not speak it for a long while, you forget the language? Because language is all about practice. If you don't use it, you lose it. <laughs> That's true. That's true. That's true. Yes, if you don't use it, you lose it. It's like a cricketer or a pianist. If you don't practice, you forget. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'll take on board the points. I mean, yeah, they're very practical and very sensible, uh, what you have just said. Another point that you brought up was that not all Africans in the diaspora would be suited to return back to the motherland. Uh, could you expand on that a little bit? Marcus Giavi himself said, that some of them he would not want to return to the motherland because their minds have been so messed up in the Western Hemisphere that for them to go to the motherland, they would be increasing the problems by going to the motherland with their negative mind enslaving mentality. And Marcus Garvey Jr. has said the same thing. It is, it, it is true. Because we do not want Africans in the diaspora going to Mother Africa and acting like Europeans with regards to our African people. And I am going to give you, and I am going to give you a practical example. Liberia. Liberia was set up. Africans from the USA. But do you know that the Africans from the USA who went to Liberia treated, most of them treated the Africans who they found in Liberia like slaves, treated them like how the Europeans were treating our people? Sounds painful, but it is true. I know this because I have friends and family from Liberia. My, I have a cousin who is married to a brother from Liberia. His parents and grandparents were originally from Nigeria, but he was born in Liberia. And I have friends as Africans from Liberia who I am in touch with all the while, 
who have shown me that regimes in Liberia treated the Africans who they found in Liberia almost akin to slaves. When Marcus Garvey wanted to establish a UNIA and ACL presence in Liberia, the president at the time was a president king. And he, all the political regimes until just recently in Liberia were only and exclusively from Africans who had returned. And what they did is that they treated the, the native people there in horrible ways. They denied them political power. Political power was in the hands of those and their descendants who had returned from the USA. This is a fact. Yeah, yeah, that's a true. This well, is in fact, that, that was responsible, yes. partly responsible for the civil war that took place. Precisely. That was that one was of the issues. That was how came, came about, yes. That's, that's right. That, 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 that was what happened. They were denied political power. And what happened is that they treated our people there like how the European races treated African people like they were savages and backward. I, I, I give you another example. In this country called Britain, do you, you know that there are some African parents from the Caribbean, Jamaica, Trinidad and Barbados, Give me an example, and you know this too, Brother Tarko, who treat the children they have who were born in this country better than the children they had in the Caribbean. Okay. That's a fact. Yeah, yeah. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. Just because th they had children who were born here, they made them so-called honorary <laughs> Europeans, so to speak, and want the children, the children that they had, their first children who they had in Jamaica, in Barbados. People tell you this all the time. Treat them horribly and want the children who were born in the Caribbean to be like slaves to the ones who were born here just because they were born in Britain. <laughs> mm. so, so that's a very interesting point. Before... And it's very true. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it is true. It is true. So that what that's telling me, our association with the West for the for the amount of time we've been here, undoubtedly have had a psychological effect. So those of us who do want to return to the motherland, we have to work on our psychology, because when we do get there. Things that, that we are used to, habits that we are used to, we're going to see things that, you know, counter that. And it's going to, you know, and sometimes you're going to pull back and think. So if, as you say, if you prepare yourself with, to the culture and everything, when certain things happen, it won't be a shock. And then you won't recoil from certain things because, like it or not, you cannot be in a place for 400 years and it does not have a psychological bearing on your mind it must have it must, yeah must. yeah there's a question here um coffee campbell do you think Nkrumah made any economical policy mistakes and if so yeah. what mm. you know Kwame Nkrumah. No, um, Kwame Nkrumah did not make any economic policy mistakes and i'll tell you why Kwame Nkrumah's economic policy was to implement what Marcus Garvey said is that we must master science and technology and industrialize. Because Kwame Nkrumah, like Marcus Garvey, and of course Kwame Nkrumah in his autobiography said that of all the books that you read the one that inspired him the most was the philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey. Is that if we do not industrialize, then Africa will simply be a reservoir of raw 
materials, raw resources that Europeans and now the Chinese and Indians come, take our resources, make cars, planes, guns, cell phones, you name it. And then all we are is that we have to buy these finished products coming from our own raw material sources. So we will always remain consumers. So Kwame Nkrumah in implementing Marcus Garvey's industrialization policy, building the dam so we could have um, hydroelectric um, power, electricity, and so on, was had established a situation economically in Ghana where Ghana in Kwame Nkrumah's time has started to make television sets, transistor radios, right. and was about to start to make cars and trucks. The Europeans were horrified. This man Kwame Nkrumah is setting a bad example. This is going to make the Europeans bankrupt because if Kwame Nkrumah is allowed to make cars and trucks and planes and ships because started making TV sets and, and, and transistor radios, then there will be no market for our goods. Not only that, the raw materials that we use to make cars, guns, trucks, and such things. We will no longer have these raw materials because all of these raw materials are in Africa. So if we are denied these raw materials, then our society, European society, will become backward. And they could not afford that. So what they did, they worked with local traitors and overthrew President Kwame Nkrumah in 1966. And one of the first things that they did, the puppet regime, was that they stopped and destroyed all the industrial and manufacturing infrastructure that President Kwame Nkrumah had started. And how many people know, check this, that before there was any motorway in Britain, M1, M2, that there was a motorway in Ghana under President Kwame Nkrumah. Do some homework where that is concerned. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll leave it with that. Do yeah. some homework <laughs> where that is concerned. I so mean, I mean, that's amazing. For all the doubters that say, oh, Africa had no direction, that goes to show that we had say, every direction that's what the fear as soon as he became president start implementing that strategy of industrialization as outlined straight by right away back. yes straight away immediately know, immediately um okay there's a another question here i don't know if you can see it. uh what were some of the economic I, I read it. i've read it oh yeah yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. Now, the first, and again, it is Coffee Campbell. Coffee, mm -hmm. of course, meeting an African born on a Friday. And um, the, 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 there is one word, one word, two words in that Coffee Campbell where you are totally and absolutely wrong. There were no land invasions in Zimbabwe. How can we invade our land? Our people reclaimed our land. The land invasions were by the European, the British settlers who came, Cicero's and others, who came and murdered our people. They were the land invaders who conducted land invasions. So never, never disrespect the thousands of our African people in Zimbabwe and elsewhere in Africa whose lands were taken away. Earlier in my presentation, I spoke about what happened to our brothers and sisters in Kenya, where their lands were taken away. So for us to reclaim our land, 
it is not land invasions. And President Mugabe was also in the process of industrialization. But what Tony Blair did was that he got George Bush Jr. He got George Bush Jr. And the rest of the European Union, um, Angela Merkel in Germany, uh, those in France and elsewhere, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, to conduct a racist European economic sanctions warfare against Zimbabwe. And this is still going on. So that was what, uh, that is what has hampered Zimbabwe because sac sanctions are weapons of war. And remember, sanctions were brought against Haiti. Cuba was not the first place in the Caribbean that were under sanctions. The first place in, 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 in the Caribbean that was under sanctions was Haiti because Haiti showing itself as an example. And by the way, yesterday, Saturday, the 22nd of August, 2020 is the anniversary of the start of the Haitian revolution on, on, on in 1791, 22nd of August, 1791 when Bookman, the voodoo high priest from Jamaica, who came to Haiti, led that, that revolution, okay? So again, just as President Kwame Nkrumah was overthrown, it was the same process of sanctions. In the US, George Walker Bush Jr., the name of the sanctions against Zimbabwe to destroy Zimbabwe financially and economically was Zidera, Z-I-D-E-R-A. So Kofi Campbell and others study the Zidera, the racist Zidera sanctions instituted by George Walker Bush and also the racist sanctions instituted and still conducted by Britain and the rest of the European Union against Zimbabwe. In the case of the states, it's Zidera, Z-I-D-E-R-A. I know this because I've been part and parcel of working as a Pan-Africanist with the government of President Mugabe against the racist destabilization against Zimbabwe. Okay. Yeah, uh, there's another point here. <clears throat> and why do you think some activists don't include uh, the Arabic slave trade when they discuss this matter? Uh, uh, you notice that when I spoke about the mm -hmm. our the, the biggest Holocaust in history, you notice that, as I said, Marcus Garvey Jr my friend and president general, political leader, you notice that I said, not only from the European Christians, so that's in reference to that 400 years period, but also from the Arab Muslims, I stated that, and also from those Jews who were involved. Read the book, The Secret Relationship Between Blacks and Jews. That gives the European Jews were who were involved in our enslavement. And in terms further where that is concerned, read the destruction of black civilization by Chancellor Williams, showing the role of Arabs and also Europeans where our people are concerned. Right? The, the reason why some of our people only restrict to the Europeans is because they do not have a history of the African race. They only have a partial history with respect to the European Christian enslavement. They need to study the Arab Muslim enslavement. Remember, the Arab Muslims invaded Africa starting in Kemet, misnamed Egypt, over a thousand years ago. Watch the video, Dr. Marcus Garvey Jr. and the Arab slave trade, where you will get a full 
educational lecture into how the Arabs invaded Africa and enslaved our people. So you have absolutely no excuse. You cannot claim ignorance. If you could claim ignorance before, you cannot claim it now. Read the destruction of black civilization by Chancellor Williams and watch the video, Dr. Marcus Garvey Jr. and the Arab slave trade, where he gives the history of the Arabs and how they invaded Africa and what they did in Africa in conjunction with European Christians. Okay. Now, that's a very interesting point, the Arab slave trade. And read also Cheek Anta Diop, his books, The African mm -hmm. Origin of Civilization and Civilization of Barbarism. Okay. Yeah, like I was saying, the Arab slave trade is very interested in that. I think most of us were aware that it started long before the European. But the thing is, with the European slave trade, I mean, myself, yourself, are casualties of it because we're here. You know, yeah. we, we, we are in the West and we know that ancestors were taken away. Yes. But at least when we look around, say the United States, we have what, 40, 50 million Africans in Brazil, here in 100 million Africans, we can see our presence, we are there, we are visible. Now what always confused me is when the Arabs now, they must have taken probably just as much or even more of us out of Africa than the Europeans, yet when you look into those countries, of Asia and stuff, you see very little African presence. What happened to us? Let me explain. First of all, unlike, unlike the European Christians, the reason why you have so few Africans in these Arab countries, and they also sold our people to the Indians and the Chinese, by the way. That's right. The reason why you have so few Africans in these Arab countries is that unlike European Christians, they castrated most of our men. They made them eunuchs. Now, when you're castrated, when you're a eunuch, can you multiply? This is the reality because they were mortally afraid of African men also having sex with their Arab women. So they made them eunuchs and had them in their so-called harams or whatever you want to call it. Okay? So that's a serious situation. So this is why you don't find so many. Most yeah. of our men were made, were castrated, made eunuchs. And what they did with our women, of course, they raped them. And, and what they did, the children from those rapes, they put them in a superior position to Africans too. It is similar to with Europeans where they put the mixed race ones in superior positions to our uh, to 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 our African people. This is why to Saint Louverture in Haiti said that whenever the Europeans want their dirty work done, they always get a mulatto, meaning a mixed race person, because it is a fact that mixed race people are given privileged positions over Africans. This is a fact. In this country, Britain, as we speak, I notice that in the news media and elsewhere, that mixed race individuals are given prominent positions over Africans. This is a fact right here in Britain. Okay. And yes, it's a deliberate policy. policy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, but that, stands, that stands to reason. But back onto the Arab thing. 
So when we look at the numbers that the Europeans took out of Africa, we're talking in the millions. Yes. So likewise, the Arabs would have done the same. So when you think about it, the castrate, you're talking in the millions of people. And I Precise. think I've read and I think I've read somewhere that only something like three in every ten survived the castration process. You know, so we can see the mass genocide that uh, was committed. Yes, the mortality rate because yeah, the mortality rate was huge. Exactly, it's savage you because so you're, you're you're cutting off one's testicles, and there's no you die, you die, you live, you live. That's it. Brutal, vicious. You know, so that's that's another area that I think Professor Pra actually has done a lot of work on that area, and he'll be somebody worth um, having a look at. Not not only Professor Clark, before Professor Clark, mm -hmm. Doctor, my friend and elder, Doctor Yosef Ben Yoshanan. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Doctor, now I'm saying quite a bit of work Yoshanan, has been yes. done. Lot of work. Uh, 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 talking about what the Arab Muslims did to our people. Dr. Yosef Ben Yochanan, I mean, he was specifically one of my elders and great friend, Dr. Yosef Ben Yochanan. Mm -hmm. Of course, I, I knew I knew um, John Henry Clark. In fact, I knew John Henry Clark. We met in Jamaica at the home of Marcus Garvey's second wife, Amy Jakes Garvey. Because when I was going to Kingston Technical High School, where Marcus Garvey Jr. taught me physics. He and his mother, Amy Jakes Garvey, lived at the same home in Jamaica. You know, they had separate houses on the same property. And I, I and um, John Henry Clark met because he was visiting her for information. You know that um, book, um, Marcus Garvey and the Vision of Africa, that type of, yeah. Well, that book really, the information and that type of thing, is virtually all from, from Queen Mother, Amy GX Gavi. <laughs> and I, I was in Jamaica when he used to come to Jamaica to her home and stayed at her home and get information. So I didn't know John Henry Clark first in, in the USA or in this country where I also met him. We first met in Jamaica <laughs> in the late 1960s. <laughs> that's okay, that's another point. Well, again, I think uh, Brother Kofi is very prolific. So come on, I'm sure there's many more watching as well. Feel free to ask questions or make comments. And you can see here the government-led industrialized policy continued in Ghana and then Krumah. This continued to bankrupt the country. That's not true. That's not, not true. true. <laughs> that's, not, that's, that, that's, that's nonsense. I mean, how, how, how can you be industrializing to bankrupt your own country? You're industrializing so that you do not have to import industrialized products from the countries who use our raw materials. You know, precisely. So, coffee is a, you, you, you do not want Africans to industrialize. I mean, the key point is the raw material for industrialization was under their very feet. Yes, the, the material. That's where it was, you know. Yes, so we are the ones who should be using our own resources right. to make our own industrial products. Why should Europeans come take our raw materials to make products to sell back to us at exorbitant prices mm -hmm, mm -hmm. only someone working with our european enemies would want that that's it that, that, that stands to reason <clears throat> and again well he's put up quite a few points i'll just we can just go through them one by one and um you see that one government cannot industrialize a country because governments don't have money and can only take money that's why the us is all collapsed it's not money that does of things size, that, yeah, I don't. that it's not money enough of itself that does things what they are after is not 
when Europeans come to Africa, they don't come for money. They come for something which is more precious than money, which is which are our precious raw materials. Precisely. That is what they come for. It's not money. What is money? Money is paper that they print and they fluctuate the values and say it values this or that. So it is not money. This so-called money paper thing, it's a con to rob and steal people. They, they did it in Nigeria where they got the Nigerians to devalue their currency and destroy the economy of Nigeria. Not because Nigeria did not have the natural resources. Um, whereas Nigeria benefited from their own um, oil and other rich sources of material. You know? The, in, instead of Nigeria refining their own oil, our crude oil taken and being refined by European countries? No. Anyone, any, anyone who advocates for us not to industrialize, meaning not to master science and technology, is an enemy of the African race and is working as a propagandist for the European racist imperialists. The, the point about Nigeria is very African. That's why I could never understand that. I think Nigeria started producing, it was one of the first countries around to start producing oil in that mass way. But yes. Well in is. the 60s. Yes. Long yes. before Arab. many of the Arab countries, Nigeria, and yet no refinery Precisely. was built. I mean, that, it's funny. I was looking at something today with Saudi Arabia, and they was trying, you know, they're trying to sell up some of the, I mean, called the big state thing. And one of the first things Saudi did when it started uh, producing oil was to build refineries. You know, it built refineries so to make sure it can refine its own oil, then sell the finished product. And we can see the amount of wealth it amassed by doing that. Precisely. So Precisely. As, as you were saying, Marcus Garvey did say those who master science and technology were those who control their own destiny. Precisely. And Africa has all the raw material that everybody else is after in order to industrialize or maintain the industrialization while it remains a desert in terms of the industrial process. I think on the African mainland now, I think it's only Ethiopia that is racing ahead. That's the model. Mm. It's put a model that it wants to industrialize. Yes, There's a lot of the African, other African countries are talking more about they want to be service type economies, which is madness. Of course, it's the service it's type it's academies in the West, and you know the industrialization should be in Africa because that's where the more raw material lies. Be okay. Because because when you have when you have service industry, you are not making and manufacturing anything. And no service industry can operate without you having a manufacturing base, an industrial base. And this is why Marcus Garvey said, master science and technology. Services alone cannot help you. You need that basic infrastructure. You need that industrial infrastructure. So you need a proper highway system in terms of communication, travel, and so on, to transport not just commuters, but your goods, etc. You need to manufacture, as I said, your own planes, your own guns. You know, in Africa, all the guns that we have in Africa are guns that we buy from the Europeans or Chinese. How can you be independent? How can you protect yourself <laughs> when the very weapons that you use, you have to buy from your enemies? Only a traitor would not want us to make our own guns. Only a traitor would not want us to make our own cars. Only a traitor would not want us to make our own ships. Only a traitor would not want us to make our own planes. Only a traitor would not want us to make the necessary goods that are necessary for life. As Kwame Nkrumah said, in neocolonialism, Africa, with the richest continent on planet Earth in terms of resources, 
but with neocolonialism, the lowest living standards. If Africa was industrialized, we would have the highest standard of living more than any other place on planet Earth. Why? We are the richest continent. And so if our riches were used to industrialize and make our own products and we export the surplus, then we would have the highest standard of living. But obviously, it is not in the interest of the non-Africans and the traitors who work for them for us to industrialize. And this is why we must always be on the lookout for the traitors and enemy agents who work to push the enemy propaganda against us as African people. All right. Uh, there's quite a few of them, but most of the points is coming from the same person. Anyway, since he's willing to put them up, we'll discuss them. Uh, that one was just uh, I explained that already. Yeah. That mm -hmm. I explained that. So th th this this Campbell fellow is definitely on a campaign of not wanting any industrialization in Africa. So we know you for what you are. Campbell. Okay. Um, yes. Yes, um, that was my arm, our armor. Two thousand is talking about what the Arab Muslims did. Yes, that's, that, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Yes, and 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 that should be read in tandem with the destruction of black civilization by Chancellor Williams, and also Walter Rodney's book, "Oh Europe Underdeveloped Africa." Again, the same thing: underdeveloped true, Africa, true, true. preventing Africa from industrializing. So this is why we know the enemy agents by the things that they say. We know the traitors by the things that they say. We know them. No, I would say out of all the books that I've read in Africa in terms of that topic, that book remains right at the top of the list. Walter Which Rodney. Book? Yeah, yes. Walter Rodney, how Europe on the develop Africa because. You know, there's a lot of people running around our head with chicken and saying, why didn't Africa this? Why didn't Africa do that? Why didn't Africa... Just go and read that book. But I tell but you something. After you read that book, you'll see the world differently. Not I'm only that. You. What happened? The mother to that book is the destruction of black civilization. Black civilization yeah. Williams. Mm -hmm. Because Walter Rodney's book is dealing from like the 15th century. That's Chancellor right. Williams' book is from 4,000 something. So, Chancellor Williams' book deals with a 6,000 year period. Yeah, right, whilst right, so. Rodney's book is dealing merely with the last 500 years, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So, both must be read. What happens is that Walter Rodney's book shows in the last 500 years, but Chancellor Williams gives the whole thing from start to finish. Yeah. Yeah, so that, it, it, it's all in those books. It tells you, and since then, of course, we have progressed even further. We have seen things even further as to why Africa is in the chaos it's in. You know, so, um, again, there's, uh, there's another point here. I'll just say my coffee. And again, he's talking about private sector is key to industrialization as well. Yeah. Uh, um, li listen, that, that, that is a total lie. China industrialized under Chairman Mao. What is happening is that if it were, as a matter of fact, what Chairman Mao did was that he put into practice what Marcus Garvey said that we should do. First of all, he unified China and kicked out all the foreigners. This is what we as Africans have to do. And then began the process of industrialization. And part of the process of that industrialization with Chairman Mao was the fact that they, that it was during Chairman Mao's time that China became a nuclear power. So the process of industrialization and taking the majority of Chinese people out of poverty started and took place 
under Chairman Mao, not after, under. So what is going on? It has nothing to do with any private so-called enterprise thing. Mm -hmm. That's a total lie. And just to say, part of Mao's strategy in order to prepare the people for the future was to go for a cultural revolution. Precisely. I think without that, you wouldn't, China wouldn't be cultural able to take Mao. Cultural emancipation. That That's was it. why... That was why when he unified China, he kicked out all the foreigners because the process of the Cultural Revolution was to cleanse the minds of the people. They go, because you cannot be successful if your minds are not cleansed in a revolutionary way. That's true. Uh, there's a point here. Um... Oh, I've seen that. The thing okay. about that, my brother, we're talking about genetically modified food, Monsanto and so on. Mm -hmm. This is something that we must reject totally. Because if we destroy our own natural seeds and depend on Europeans with their genetically modified products of food, that means we will be at their mercy. So they will starve us exterminate us so we must not use their genetically modified um seeds and we must not allow them in our countries and any regime that seeks to introduce these genetically modified foods the, it is the duty of the people in the countries to rise up and reject and stop that don't act as if you're powerless and you can't do anything for yourself when any so-called government tries to do things that are against the interests of the people, inimical to the interests of the people, it is for the people to remove such governments and to prevent them from destroying the people. It's as simple as that. You, as Marcus Garvey said in the philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey, there can be no government without the people and therefore right. a government must be the expression of the will, not of the politicians, but of the people. Mm -hmm. Totally we'll go along with that. I mean, I would even go as far to say we see um, uh, recent cases of it in Africa. We saw in Sudan recently when the people had enough. The people power pushed out that Precisely. the Bashir. I mean, Precisely. right, the army had to side, but the army had to weigh the mood of the people you know and see the way the people was going and just we have seen the same thing in mali and we even see now echo was demanding the reinstatement but the people are saying no way they do not want him back you, you see the problem yeah. in, 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 the, the problem in mali with keta there is that arab muslim terrorists have been wreaking havoc in mali and keta the former president has not been capable of dealing with and defeating the Arab, the, 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 the Muslim um, terrorist threat in Mali. And it's not just in Mali, in other African countries, Boko Haram in Nigeria, etc. Mm -hmm. It's a serious situation. It's a serious situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, it's a serious situation. Um, okay, there's another point here. Um, what's your opinion of the suggested idea that the sporinism, the sporin African can be? Oh, oh, that no, no, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in total disagreement. I'm in total disagreement with that. <laughs> that diaspora and Africans can only get reparations by forming a new African country on the continent. No, no, um, I'm. That, that that's that's another form of divide and rule policy i mentioned what happened in liberia mm -hmm. and the same situation happened in sierra leone also that's right we are the so-called creoles against those who they had found there no mm -hmm. i'm totally yeah. against that a any 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 must be togetherness there must be no establishment of any artificial state about with Africans from the Western Hemisphere 
establishing some artificial state in Mother Africa. I'm absolutely and totally against mm -hmm. it. A form of divide and rule. Absolutely no. Yeah, well, I, I'm in a hundred percent agreement with that. In, in my in my own family, I have mm -hmm. relatives who are married to brothers and sisters from the motherland. And so when they go to Nigeria, Ghana, wherever, ever, no, there no establishment of any artificial state. That's divide and rule strategy. Of Absolutely. Of course. of course. That's just to me, that's just out of the question. And whoever's thinking okay. that Absolutely. is out of their mind. That shouldn't because, be even be a question. <laughs> <laughs> because the way forward is obviously to reintegrate ourselves. Precisely. Precisely. You know, and remember, Africa is there, and Africa will continue with or without us. Precisely. The onus is on us in the diaspora to make that effort, not to work with the our continent. And yes, it's together. So we have to approach it's them right. because remember, they're the ones who retain the culture, and they're the ones who retain the language. We have lost Precisely. the culture. We have lost the language. So, what are we going there to set up the state? Exactly. Just, to carry their, just to carry a Western um, a Western way of doing things and a Western way of thinking and plunk it back in Africa. No way. No way. That, that, that is just total, total madness. And I know there's mad people out there that are thinking that way. But to me, None of that. those are the ones Garvey was highlighting. They don't want Stay in Africa. Where you are. Africa don't, don't want them in you. Africa. Africa don't need you. No. And I must just say, there's another thing that disturbs me sometimes because as you know i'm married to somebody from the continent right and when you do go well to the done. continent and when you are that's a long time ago over 20 years it doesn't so matter you, uh, i say you I know, so you. what i'm trying to say it's to me that's the way forward yes in, in to reintegrate as in as in my family as i said also yeah. now <laughs> One of the things I do notice, and I do notice is on the rise, is when you do go into Africa, you tend to get your little enclaves of, you know, diasporan Africans coming in, and they're setting themselves almost like they're setting themselves apart. Yes. From Same the Africans there. Same they're segregated themselves, and they're... You know, they're still, they're still in, um, they're living in the Western Hemisphere. They need to go through that process. That's why I said when Mao had that culture revolution, it was effective and it was for a reason. Any Africans thinking of relocating in Africa should themselves go for a form of cultural uh, purification before they go and do not bring your Western hang-ups with you. That's, that's the last thing uh, Africa needs. Um, okay, uh, there's a couple more points. There's another point here, but, they, but there's one point I want to touch on. It's to do with Garvey, and you may be able to clarify this. Mm -hmm. Because I read somewhere just before Garvey died, I don't know how long before, he actually became converted to Catholicism. That, that's not true. No, 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 but I'm just saying that is out no, there. No, I've no, read I, that. I, I, I heard, read I that. So I wanted to clarify that for me. And also, Garvey's relationship with the Christian church is another thing is in need of clarification. Because why I'm saying that, I've got a little clip that I'm going to play. And it's to do with the Church of England and their role in the slave trade. Yeah, let me answer then. Yeah. Um, first of all, this is something that his son, Marcus Garvey Jr., and I, you know, um, dealt with many, many, many years ago. Marcus Garvey did not convert to any Roman Catholicism. That's not true. And in terms of the organization, the UNIA and the ACL, it was deliberately not a religious organization because Marcus Garvey knew that once you brought religion into the picture, 
it would be a recipe for divide and you rule using religious um, denominations. So the UNIA and the ACL is strictly secular. It's no religious component to it. The UNIA and the ACL. And I have been a member of the UNIA and the ACL since 1968. So the UNIA and the ACL, nothing to do with any religious organization. Of course, some people came in the organization and tried to turn it into some religious thing. But Marcus Garvey kicked them out. Okay? And he did not convert to any so-called um, Roman Catholicism. And people read Marcus Garvey's um, final work, so to speak, published. Um, the Course of African Philosophy. The Course of African Philosophy. It shows that the creator is a spirit, etc., and so on. And that, and also in the philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey. And that whenever we visualize the creator, if we want to visualize what the creator looks like, the creator must be someone looking like us as African people. And because, as he said, other races, when they conceive in their minds of what the creator looks like, they conceive quite rightly so as someone looking like them which 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 is only natural mm -hmm. so for the creator for african people some people have a need to have some visual idea of the creator not everyone some people have no such need but for those who have that need if you want to visualize the creator because you have that need then the creator must have african features i myself for example i know the creator i believe in the creator but i have no need to visualize the creator in what is called human terms but if i were to do so the creator would definitely have to have my african features my hair my complexion my nose etc that goes without saying that's true yeah because <clears throat> Yeah, I just wanted that clarified because I'm saying it's out there. I've heard yes, it so yes. many times. Perfectly right. Yes, yes. And, um, but I repeat, the organization mm -hmm. and UNIA, ACL, Marcus Garvey Jr. also repeat this all the time. Nothing to do, nothing to do with any religious organization. As a matter of fact, in the 19, in the 1980s, 1990s, there was a brother who belonged to the Ethiopian Coptic Church in Jamaica. And he was a part of our UNIA and ACL organization. And Marcus Garvey Jr. had to tell him off because he was trying to turn the UNIA and ACL into some Ethiopian Coptic organization. And Marcus Garvey Jr. and myself and others say, listen, the UNIA and the ACL is an African organization, nothing to do with any Ethiopian Coptic church or any religious denomination. Don't try and divide our people along any religious line. So I'm telling you people live and direct where this is concerned. Okay, what I'd like to do now is play a clip because as I see the title was uh, Reparations or Refacturation. And it's to do with the church. And the reason why this is significant, as we know, a lot of our people have been swept up into Christianity, the church, and they tend to turn a blind eye. First, they were saying the church was never involved in enslaving us and everything. And when the evidence, was involved. And when the evidence came forward, it's like, they're just prepared to bury their head in the sand and said, well, uh, forget about it. But <laughs> it was one of the, as you know, it's one of the pillars of the state, the Church, the church of England. Church and state. Yeah. So what I want to do now is quickly, oh, um, sorry, put the wrong one. Yeah. Church of England. Yeah. Was established by Henry the Heath and the head of the Church of England 
the first head of the Church of England is Henry VIII. Uh -huh. And henceforth, every head of church, the Church of England, is the English monarch. So it is not any religious organization per se. It was it came out of the fact that Henry VIII fell out with the Roman Catholic Pope mm -hmm. and set up his own Church of England. So Henry VIII was the head. And all succeeding British monarchs are the heads of the Church of England, not the Archbishop of Canterbury. A lot of people don't know this. Well, it's just to show how integrated they are with the whole transatlantic safe trade. They were part and parcel of it. And I was, of course, far to say, without them, the slave trade in Britain couldn't have happened the way it happened. True. Without, the, without the blessing of the church. Mental so enslavement using religion. Yeah. So it's just a quick John this. The SS Jesus of Lubeck. Yeah, well, that's right. It's just to play this clip quickly. Yeah. Many organizations across the world are reflecting on their role in the history and legacy of the slave trade. The Church of England's history in this regard is shameful as the Church itself traded in human beings. The bicentennial of the Act for the Abolition of the Slave Trade in 1807 celebrated in 2007 provided unprecedented opportunities to acknowledge the Church's complicity in the slave trade. The then Archbishop of Canterbury Rowan Williams said the body of Christ is not just a body that exists at any one time, it exists across history and we therefore share the shame and the sinfulness of our predecessors, and part of what we can do, with them and for them in the body of Christ, is pray for acknowledgement of the failure that is part of us, not just some distant them. To speak here of repentance and apology is not words alone, it's part of our weakness to the gospel, to a world that needs to hear that the past must be faced and healed and cannot be ignored, by doing so we are actually discharging our responsibility to preach good news, not simply to look backwards in awkwardness and embarrassment, but to speak of the freedom we are given to face ourselves, including the unacceptable regions of our history. Recent research has highlighted other links between the wider church and the slave trade by highlighting how a number of individual clergy received payments on the 1833 Abolition of Slavery Act compensating them for slaves which they all their families owned. We the sons and daughters of those kidnapped from Africa and who suffered at the hands of the Church of England still awaits to engage in a meaningful dialogue with the church in terms of financial recompense. Yeah, so I just wanted to play that um, just to show that even the church itself, I think the Archbishop of Canterbury came out and gave a Wesleyan nickel speech, which was supposed to be, which was supposed to be an apology. Hold on, uh, let me turn this off. Uh, Yes, I, I, I heard I heard about that speech that, that he mm -hmm. did. But, but you see, it's not just the Church of England, too, you know. It's all of these Christian European churches. Oh, because, yes. Because remember, at the, at, the, um, at the Treaty of Tordesilius, which was um, presided over by the Roman Catholic Pope, who divided the, 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 the Africa and the Western Hemisphere, between Spain and Portugal. Yep. The Pope, the Roman Catholic Pope, mm -hmm. divided the Western Hemisphere and Mother Africa between Spain and Portugal, because both were Roman Catholic countries and were vying for power. Remember the first set of Europeans who were involved in our enslavement were not the Spanish, but the Portuguese. Right? And, and that started out with a guy called Henry the Navigator, Portuguese prince, who, by the way, was no navigator because he never went on a voyage. <laughs> he never went on a voyage. You know, but line comes so, so natural to them, you know? No wonder the native people in the USA say they speak with forked tongues. But at the Treaty of Tordesillas, the Roman Catholic Pope, 
right and what happened was that the protestants like the the um the the, the, the french um and dutch and english and so on said well who, 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 who the hell is the roman catholic pope to divide for the spanish and the portuguese what about us we are going in four hours and let us remember that queen elizabeth the first who was the daughter of henry the eighth the first head of the church of england her father who established the church of england she financed john hawkins voyages to west africa where they invaded in west africa and captured and kidnapped our people our people did not sell each other john hawkins writes about it and one of his ships was known as the ss jesus of lubeck lubeck because that was some place in germany yes so this is why you hear africans saying oh jesus is a slave ship it's in reference to that <laughs> and what happened and i tell you something the true the the, the 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 christian religion was absolutely essential in the enslavement of african people because physical right, enslavement right. could not work the most permanent form of slavery is mental enslavement and that was done through the to the christian religion the christian religion was used to enslave Africans psychologically well, well, and we have a situation with Muslims too whereby Africans who are Muslims still suffer from racism from Arabs even though they are all Muslims but they suffer from racism in Darfur in the Sudan Africans even though they are Muslims are murdered by those Arab Muslims are those who are African Arab, you know, those mixed race type people. So like Bashir and that type of thing that they think because they have some Arab blood in them that they are superior to Africans. This is how Bashir and others operate. It's that same mixed race syndrome whereby they think that they are superior to Africans so it doesn't matter that you and them are in the same religion as a matter of fact Arab Muslims will tell you that they are the superior Muslims that even though other people are Muslims that they practice a division in Islam too just like in Christianity that they who are Arabs that they are the true Muslims because they are related by blood, by race, to Muhammad, Bilal, who was a Muslim, who was a slave, to Muhammad, suffered from racism from the Arabs that Muhammad himself had to say that they should not treat Bilal in a racist way. So it goes to show that belonging to a religion does not save you from racism racism is racism because your race doesn't change your religion can change but people will discriminate against you because of your race and your race is something you can do nothing about michael jackson found out that, that that despite the amount of money that he used and others like him to change what he looks like you cannot change your race you can change your class you can change your religion you can change your clothes, your car, your house. You cannot change your race. That's immutable. And this is why with Chairman Mao, to be Chinese was always constant. He merely used foreign things for his own purpose. And what Chairman Mao and Chow and Lai did was that they put into practice Marcus Garvey's ideology and practice of self-reliance unified yeah. china unified china kicked out and prevented non-chinese from coming into china to this day 
any foreigners coming into China are under strict supervision and surveillance. Surveillance. The Chinese do not allow non-Chinese to come and go any and anywhere in their country. But what happens in the Caribbean and in Africa? Too many of our people, we allow foreign races to come in our countries and go all over and make mischief and that type of thing. They are under no form of control. And this is to our undoing. Yeah, that, yeah, that's definitely the case. They are allowed to come into our countries and make so-called documentaries and films, derogatory things about us, mm -hmm. and show and make a lot of money coming about their travel, travel, travel people. You know, you have this guy, um, what's his name? He was a Tory MP, Portillo, and another one, what do they call it? Simon Reeves, and but you you, you know the type, um, mm -hmm. you, you yeah, guy Whitaker in the past. But this is what they do. They come to our countries and become rich, make money, showing derogatory documentaries about us. Our governments, and in fact, we as people, should prevent them from coming to our countries and making these negative things about our people. Always showing our countries and our people in a bad and negative light. They don't show the sums that are in Britain and elsewhere in Europe and so on. But they come and show our people in the most degrading conditions, as if to say that is what all of our people are alike. They don't show the nice houses and the other um, good standard of living, you know, amenities that we have in Africa and the Caribbean. They're always showing some zinc fence, some slum, because this is how they want us to be. And they know that when you show things, you know, a picture is worth a thousand years. That's true. That that's true. Sticks in the minds of people. And so it helps them to maintain that false sense of racist superiority where we as African people are concerned. Mm -hmm. We must stop them coming into our communities and our countries. Some of our people like to chat too much and talk negative things mm -hmm. about our people. We have enemy agents all over working in the interests of non-Africans. All they know to do is to talk negative things about African leaders like President Mugabe, President Nkrumah, Marcus Garvey, and others. They are enemy agents as must be treated as enemy agents, the vermin that they are. Yeah, so um, in the last, and let's check the time, yeah, in the last five minutes, just to round up, um, what I like to you to say the, the, the impact that Garvey had because you mentioned Mao and I am under no illusions that Marcus Garvey heavily influenced uh, leaders such as him. I mean, many and, leaders and, and, and also um, Ho Chi Minh. Yeah, yes, because they came out and said so. Go to pub public meetings as a seaman yeah. and listen to Marcus Garvey, and that inspired him to go to Vietnam. That's to right. free his people. So they what I'm saying, and say so. So, so my like question is, no, just a bit, my question is now, in terms of the motherland, in terms of the continent, yes. how much sway do you see Garvey or relevance do you see Garvey still having today? Uh, I don't know if you saw the the announcement recently by the uh, president of Ghana. I I I I heard that the he, he, uh, yes, he and he gave to what praise to uh, Garvey because he just came out plainly and said, and Krumah was a disciple of Garvey, and when Krumah became leader of Ghana, he started to implement what he had learned within the UNIA and ALC. As I said and, earlier. In my presentation. Yes. 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 I, I said so, it. In so that's what I'm trying to. So that's what I'm saying now. Garvey and Garveyism, in terms of its relevance today, especially on the continent, how do you see it? Because just before you answer it, remember if you go to Africa now, you'll find reggae music 
is bigger in Africa probably than it is in Jamaica right now. You'll find the influence of the Rasta movement, which you know came out of the Garvey movement, is heavily, is heavily influential in Africa. And everybody's lips at the moment, if you watch a lot of the TV channels in Africa, if you look at a lot of uh, what the social media is putting out, you're hearing there's an upsurge of the whole term Pan-Africanism. Mm. This is just the ordinary groundswell of people. This term Pan-Africanism or Pan-Africanist is constantly on their lips because they're waking up to the fact that unless something is done, you will remain in a perpetual state of what the Europeans have left you in and now the Chinese are sitting on you. So, going back to that, you would say that, do you think that all stemmed from Garvey? And do you think Garvey is as relevant now as he was, say, in the 1920s? Marcus Garvey has always been relevant. And, and when you say Garveyism, Garveyism is simply another word for Pan-Africanism. Marcus Garvey was the greatest Pan-Africanist leader the world has ever known. And with the UNIA and ACL, which was an African government in waiting, set the foundation, the black print, the template for Pan-Africanism, for Africans at home and abroad. So Marcus Garvey's ideology and practice is a black print and is the only, not one of, the only solution for the African race because it deals with self-reliance in every area of life, economics, politics, religion, spirituality, military. Without the implementation of Marcus Garvey's black print, solution which is pan-africanism the african race is doomed what we are having now is a resurgence of pan-africanism and we must increase the tempo of this resurgence remember the rastas came out as an off offshoot of, of marcus garvey's organization because leonard howell heinz dunkley and Hibbert were members of Marcus Garvey's organization who, when Haile Selassie was crowned, Rastafari was crowned, swore allegiance to Haile Selassie. But remember, Pan-Africanism has nothing to do with swearing any allegiance to Haile Selassie or any Ethiopian king or queen. Pan-Africanism has to do with the liberation and progress of the African race. It's as, and it's a Republican situation. It's not about any kings or queen. As Marcus Garvey said, one president, one army, one navy, and one air force. He never said one king, one queen. One president, one army, one navy, and one air force to protect and progress Africans at home and abroad. No more than ever, Africans need to implement the Pan-Africanism of Marcus Garvey, the Black Prince solution. We have in the USA elections coming up and some people are making the same mistake that they made with Barack Obama, the mixed race um, guy. Some of them are saying, as they said with Barack Obama, vote for Kamala Harris, whose mother is a Tamil from India, father African from Jamaica. Just vote for her just to get rid of Trump. But Marcus Garvey said that whenever we vote in foreign countries, we must first negotiate and have our list of demands, our agenda to know what we must negotiate to get what we want for our votes. We must just, just vote for the sake of voting. This was a mistake that most of our people made. This was a mistake that most of our people made. 
You understand what I'm saying? Okay? For real. So, Marcus Garvey, in terms of Pan-Africanism, and as Marcus Garvey explained in the philosophy and opinions, and also in, in the course of African philosophy, our ideology of African fundamentalism, Pan-Africanism, we have our own ideology. Our ideology is not European capitalist, nor European Marxist Leninist, or European communism. As a matter of fact, Karl Marx was a racist. Karl Marx, the, the, the founder of the communist ideology. So Pan-Africanism is rooted in our African cultural value system, whereby it operates in the interests of our people as a whole and not for the few. And it does not attack and is against spirituality and religious practice as materialistic religions like capitalism, communism, and socialism are. Mm -hmm. Get that straight. We have our own African spirituality, as you know, brother Tahaka and others. Okay? We, okay. we must study our African religious and spiritual traditions. Okay. So, as African people, let us remember in this time that we have our own agenda. We have our own aims and objectives. And our aims and objectives are to provide security and progress for our African race at home and abroad. Okay. And just a final point. Mm -hmm. As we know, <clears throat> God will never actually set foot on the continent of Africa. We know. We, we, know, we know why. He was well, born. No, hold on, hold on. Yeah, the question is, I'm just trying to. He was born in Jamaica in 1887. We know he traveled extensively in Europe and the Americas. Never managed to get foot to Africa. So in the past, I've heard people from the continent said to me, since Garvey has never set foot in Africa, what made you think Garvey could understand us so much that he could actually prescribe a solution for Africa, a place that he's never been? Because as I was told by some of them, there's many people in the continent of Africa, within the continent of Africa, who, have, who had already came up with, the, with their own solution. So the point I'm trying to say now, why, what is it about Garvey that you think? The fact that he never managed to reach Africa, he still had the foresight to put down or bring forth solution that even African leaders or aspiring African leaders at the time, such as Nereri, such as Nkrumah, such as Kenyatta, grasped. As soon as they came across it, they grasped it. And when they came to power, they tried to implement it. So where do you think Garvey got his inspiration from? Who were some of the people that inspired him? Yes, um, it, it's simple. What teaches and inspires people is not where you actually go physically. It is where you go mentally. It is where you go mentally. That's one. Two, Marcus Garvey, before he left Jamaica, was taught by people like Dr. Love, who was a doctor from the Bahamas, who was a Pan-Africanist. Marcus Garvey was inspired by Booker T. Washington, the book Up From Slavery. And that was before he had left Jamaica. So for people to be inspired and to have solutions, you don't have to be in a particular country. 
it depends on where your mind is. Marcus Garvey, before going to the USA, traveled to a lot of countries in Europe. He also traveled to a lot of countries, and I don't call them the Americas because I'm not giving any credit to, um, to America, Vespucci, no Americas, that's not true. But he traveled to places like Costa Rica, Panama, and things like that. Okay, and 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 and, and, and things and things like that, you know. And um, I, 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 I ignore what that um, fellow is saying because those are lies, total and absolute lies. And don't put any more of those lies there by that um, enemy agent. I'm serious. I don't joke. Okay, I don't want to see any more lies by that enemy agent telling lies about Marcus Garvey and Pan Africanism. We must not entertain traitors and enemy agents. I, I am an activist. I'm going to say activist. When Marcus Garvey Jr. and I and others were, we were operating from the 1960s onwards, we don't deal with armchair things. We deal with things for, for real. We don't play. Okay, we, 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 we don't engage in just academic discussions. We deal with, 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 with traitors. Now, um, what Marcus Garvey did, he was banned from going to Africa. Just like his newspaper, the black, the Negro world, the black world, because Negro is Spanish meaning black. The black world was banned. If one was found with papers of Marcus Garvey's um, organization in Africa, they were imprisoned and in some cases killed, right? So they banned him because his very presence would have accelerated more things. But all over Africa, there were branches, divisions of the UNIA and the ACL. So even though Marcus Garvey did not visit Africa physically because he was prevented from visiting physically. He was prevented, you must understand. The words through his medium, newspapers and otherwise, got true to our people in Africa, which inspired them, which was why he was so well known in Africa. So they banned his physical presence, but they could not ban his ideas and his philosophy. South Africa had the largest number of UNIA and ACL divisions in Africa. And in the Caribbean, Cuba had the largest amount of divisions. Read Race First by my brother from Trinidad, Port of Spain. You know, Trinidad had more UNIA and ACL divisions than Jamaica, where Marcus Garvey was born. So despite Marcus Garvey being prevented, despite his Liberian project being sabotaged by the traitor William Du Bois, working as an agent for the US um, State Department, Marcus Garvey's ideology and practice inspired. Patrice Lumumba, Nairi, all of those Africans, President Mugabe, and, and so on. And this Ghana's shipping line was named the Black Star Line after Marcus Garvey. The Black Star Square in Accra is because of Marcus Garvey. The Black Star in Ghana's flag is because of Marcus Garvey's Black Star. So, they banned the man, but they could not ban or destroy his ideas. And I also noticed that a lot of African countries and so called independent they adopted the red, black, and the green precise in, in their flags. Yes, the, the color for the African race. That's right. 1920, at, the, at that Pan African meeting, it was the largest Pan African meeting in the world that filled Madison Square Gardens, over 20,000. Henry yeah. Sylvester's meeting were just yeah. a few people in 1900. Just a few people. And Marcus yet, and yet it's massive. interesting, it's interesting that the Pan-African Congresses, we are told, 
Sylvester Williams was the first. The Garvey Congresses was never given that status, the Garvey Conventions. Not, not. As, as what the Pan African Congresses were given. But the thing about it, that, that is only not given by enemy agents because the, the, the what Sil Henry Sylvester Williams, who was from Trinidad, did mm -hmm. when you looked at his program, his list of demands, he wasn't talking about Africans having our own governments and so on. It was a it was a reformist liberal begging bowl thing. Marcus Garvey's list of demands and what we had to do was about power, military, economic, and so on. Henry Sylvester Williams is not. So obviously, the enemy is not going to promote the real Pan-Africanism. Read the two programs. Henry Sylvester Williams' program and Du Bois, as opposed to Marcus Garvey's program. And you will see which one is the real Pan-Africanism. Marcus Messiah Garvey, the greatest Pan-Africanist leader the world has ever known. And my brother, never ever give the oxygen of publicity to enemy traitors who seek to divide and confuse our people with lies about Marcus Garvey and other Pan-Africanist leaders. We must not use our platforms to promote and give publicity to enemy agents. Remember our enemies in their mediums that they control, publicity and otherwise. They do not give us publicity. The only publicity that they give where we are concerned are negative publicity against us. We are at war, my brother. And war is war. War is war. It's no joke thing. And in war, Lives are lost and lives are saved. We must practice what Marcus Garvey said. Self-reliance in all areas of life. Up ye mighty race, you can accomplish what we will. And with confidence, we will have won even before we have started. Because as Marcus Garvey said, we are twice, if we have no confidence, we will be twice defeated in the race of life. And I scorn and despise and I fight against all traitors, all traitors and all enemies of the African race. I am not a Christian and I do not turn the cheek to enemies and traitors. Marcus Messiah Gavi, the only respect that we can pay to Marcus Garvey is to continue to implement the black print solution of Marcus Garvey, the greatest Pan-Africanist leader the world has ever known. I, Mandingo, the African from Jamaica, whose mother's mother's cousin was Amy Ashwood Garvey, a founder member of the organization and a great Pan-Africanist in her own right. And I also recall Brother Malcolm X, our Queen Francis Chris Wilson, Queen Mother in Zinga, and all the other African ancestors who fought for our liberation. Dessalines, Henry Christophe, Africans all over who fought and gave their lives so that we could be where we are. My great-great-grandparents who with other Africans in Jamaica and elsewhere in the Caribbean defeated the British and forced them that we won emancipation from chattel enslavement on the 1st of August, 1834. I salute you and we shall honor you, our glorious African ancestors, by defeating the enemies and traitors. And we as Africans shall be free and we will be victorious every time. One creator, one aim, one destiny. Yes, a shame. So again, we have come to 
our conclusion for this week and i thank everybody for who tuned in and remember these videos are left up on the platform so those of who who never got to see it you'll have a chance to um, uh, view them so again on, the, on behalf of the pan-african congress movement i would like to say i very much appreciate all those who tune in every sunday at 6 p.m uh, the PSEM, as its name implies, is a Pan-Africanist organization that came about in 1975. And it came about as a direct result of a Congress that it visited in Tanzania, Dar es Salaam in 1974, known as the Sixth Pan-African uh, Congress. Out of that Congress, the members who attended and later formed this organization were so moved and so impressed with what they saw and what they heard that they were determined to come back and implement to the best of their ability um, an organization that could begin to be part of the solution for the liberation of our people. So since 1975, the PACM, we have had our ups and downs, but one of the things that nobody can accuse us of is being quitters. We have continued, regardless of the opposition, regardless of the terrain, to put out information which we believe will help our people to gain the level of consciousness which is necessary for them to truly free themselves and emancipate themselves from this mental slavery. So that when you do move onto the African continent, you move on it with a sense of confidence, with a sense of foresight. You're not moving on it in a confused state because the teachings that you would have got from the PSCM, I believe, would more than prepare you for life on the continent of Africa. And I'm a living testimony to that. When I first went to Africa, I'm not saying I was perfect, but a lot of the pitfalls that I saw so many people made and so many people fell into because they did not have that prior knowledge. They did not have that prior insight that wasn't the case with myself and the other brothers and sisters as well because we were thoroughly schooled before we went so we can hold our head high and we can go with a sense of pride and when we do go to africa and see some of the practices and some of the shenanigans that the europeans and other non-africans are carrying on with it is our duty to challenge it not just sit and look the other way, challenge it. And the more of us present on the continent of Africa, there will be a change. Because a lot of the things that I see brothers and sisters on the continent of Africa have been putting up with for years, and they're told, well, that's how it's always been. That's how it's always been done. The brothers and sisters from the diaspora who know better have gone and challenge it and are making great, um, you can say, strides that are making great contribution to that society in helping our brothers and sisters to see that these people are not gods. These people are not invincible. In fact, they should be looking up to you because you are the gods to them because you came before them. So until next week, I'd like to thank everybody again so from the Pan-African Congress Movement, I bid you goodbye until next week. So I like to say the Kwahiri. <laughs>